Okay, so um, hi everyone again. Um, I'm back and I'm going to talk about steady state analysis. So um, in previous presentations, we already di discussed this. We already uh, mentioned that often you should uh, put your model in a steady state before you apply a perturbation because otherwise the perturbation might not be um, relevant um, or not might not be easy to interpret. Uh, there's many other reasons why steady states are important and 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 several people study steady states. Um, you know, I don't want to spend a long time, but this comes all the way back from the origins of medicine, where um, people noted that uh, living systems are more or less uh, in in stable um, amounts, stable weight, so they don't change their weight very, very much only by a small percent every day, perhaps. Um, and so the concept of steady states and homeostasis comes from uh, way back then. But in general, um, um, biological systems are not uh, growing forever, even though they may be growing, such as like a bacterial culture, or even a cell may be growing, but they don't grow forever. At some point, they either stop growing or they divide or eventually they are more or less at uh, the state of the system is more or less stable. So we like the concept of a steady state that represents that. Of course, not often, um, not always are systems in steady state. Many times they are oscillating or um, other types of behaviors, but they oscillate within a certain range. So we could talk about a, a quasi steady state. We will see a little bit of an example um, similar to that later on. So, um, what I'm going to talk about is how you can use, how do you do steady state analysis? Um, I'm going to focus more on COPASI that actually has a steady state task, uh, but some of this can also be done uh, with virtual cell, of course. So just to recapitulate, when you have a dynamical system, a set of chemical reactions, like all these models are, um, you can write the differential equations and, uh, you know, the right-hand side of the differential equations are all these terms which are basically based on the kinetics of each of the steps. So you have, for each species, you have a, a differential equation with the right-hand side that's essentially usually a um, more or less complex uh, nonlinear algebraic equation on, on the, on the left-hand side. Of course, the whole thing is a differential equation. Um, so when you want to look at the steady state, by definition, a steady state is when the concentrations don't change. So the differential equations mean quantify the change in concentration. So of course, the change in concentration is zero. So in this case, we can actually forget about the differentials and focus just on this part, which is essentially a set of algebraic equations equal to zero. This is the steady state definition that no species is changing a long time. So all we have to do is to solve this system of nonlinear algebraic equations, and that gives us a steady state solution, which are a set of concentrations for each of the species that are basically the values at which they stabilize. Uh, and we will talk later on about stability and also one point that I mentioned underneath here, which is that there may be more than one possible steady state. Some systems allow, because these are nonlinear differential, uh, nonlinear equations, um, they in general may have more than one solution. In practice, many of the solutions may be um, non-physical, such as with negative concentrations. So those don't matter. They're never reachable. But there can still be uh, several positive um, multiple states. But we will talk about that later on, or, or, or not so much. So. There are basically two major approaches to find um, a steady state. And as I mentioned here, one of them is by just looking at the algebraic equations. The other one is by looking at the differential equations. So let's look first at the differential equations. And this is the method that you have to use if, you, if you're running V-cell. So by definition, the steady state is when no concentration is changing. So what what should you do? You should run a time course simulation and wait until you see concentrations not changing. Now, I should already highlight that you need to be careful because sometimes, in, often in models, you have species at many different scales. So in here, you have a few species on, on a scale that is this plot is displaying, but you have a number of others that are so close to zero 
that you cannot see whether those lines are they have slopes or they are actually straight. So in this case, we plotted the same data, but on a on a plot that has a logarithmic scale, then you can actually see all the curves, right? So this one here, for example, is much lower order of magnitude. And in this case, they're more or less stable here, right? So by eye, I could say this is a steady state. However, by eye is not always, um, our eyes are not always that good, uh, particularly with plots like this that don't show a lot of change. Um, so we would like to have a, a specific criterion to, to designate what does it mean to have no change. Um, in fact, we want a change smaller than a certain value rather than a change that is actually ex exactly zero because that is unlikely to be um, possible to find with numerical solutions. So we define this um, quantity here, which we call the steady, well, which, which we measure the relative change in a species concentration between two time points. So we find the difference between current time point and the previous time point. And because we want it as a relative distance, we divide it by, well, the previous time point, it could also be by the current one, doesn't matter. The difference will not be large. This is just taking out the scale. And then this number epsilon tells us how much, uh, well, this, this ratio tells us how much change there is. And we're going to have a criterion, which we call epsilon or steady state resolution in Kopasi's terms, which is a number that you think that anything smaller than that is good enough for you and it's no change. So in, by default in Kopasi, uh, in the steady state task, um, that is a number 10 to the minus nine, although of course that can be changed. That's a, that's a parameter that you can change in the analysis. Sometimes you may have to do that. So this is by finding the steady state by simulation only. And as I said, if you um, if you just analyze the curve, you need to see all stable lines and be careful because the ones that are very small down here, they could be growing. Uh, so you need to wait and see, you also need to see those. So try to plot also the data in a logarithmic scale so that you can see all of them. You see this variable and that variable are actually much slower than the others. Some variables here were already steady here, these ones are only steady over there. The other approach is to solve the algebraic equation. So if you just have this, if you just look at the left-hand side of the, of the differential equations and equal that to zero, you have a set of nonlinear algebraic equations. And Newton came up with a method, well, Newton and Raphson uh, came up with a method called the Newton-Raphson method, um, which tries to find um, the zeros of a function, which is exactly what we're doing. We're trying to find the zeros of, of an algebraic function. Um, and this is the methodology. By the way, I uh, shamefully copied the Wikipedia page, which is pretty good on this topic. Um, and essentially the idea is that you find, if you, if you start with a, uh, an estimate of the solution, which in this case would be this Xn for some nonlinear function. So the, the first guess is this one, that Xn is the zero, but of course Xn is not zero, right? The zero is here. Um, but we start with that guess. We can obtain a new guess, an improved guess, by looking at the slope of the curve, which is basically its derivative, and projecting it to the axis, right? So this point here is the new guess for the, for the zero of the function. And as you can see, it's closer to the real zero. So that's our x plus one. So now this is the new point. We would again take the slope here, would draw a tangent and we would obtain this one. And if you continue, you will eventually hit close enough to this uh, zero of the solution. So that's exactly uh, what you can do as well with these equations. Of course, in our case, we don't just have one curve because that's one curve per species. So we have, it's a multidimensional function, but we do the same thing. We do this in all of the species. And again, we use exactly the same criterion between one iteration and the other iteration to find out if the change is smaller than a certain value, then we might be okay. That would be uh, one approach. The other approach is to measure um, um, from the set of derivatives to find out how close those derivatives are to zero as well. So these two criteriums, we're going to be calling them distance and rate um, in Kopasi. So in Kopasi can use both these methods. 
and it actually automates them uh, in a way that the user just presses the button and waits for a solution. Um, now, I should mention one thing before I go further. The Newton method, unfortunately, even though it's great and converges quadratically, you could study that every time you get closer, you get closer to the solution by the um, in a quadratic function. It is not, unfortunately, it is not guaranteed to converge. If your first guess is too far away from the solution, uh, the Newton method may not converge. And in practice, it often happens. Many times, the first guess, which usually is your initial uh, conditions, um, is sufficiently far away from the, the solution that it won't converge. So that's why we, we have a combined approach in Copasi. So the combined approach uses both the Newton method and the time course simulation. And this is how it goes. First of all, we try Newton right away with the, with the initial conditions. And if it if it converges, that is, if it gets a value of epsilon, a value of, of um, epsilon smaller than our criterion, then we, we stop there and we're happy. We, we're done. If that didn't work out, what we're going to do is we're going to run a short time course. We run it for 0 0.1 units of time. And this is arbitrary. We don't know what your time scale is, but that's how we start, 0 0.1 units of time. And at the end of that, we check again, is Epsilon um, already satisfied? I mean, did the change between the last time point and the current one, is that smaller than the resolution? If it is, we can stop here, but often it isn't. So what do we do now? Um, now we're closer to the solution than we were in the beginning when we tried the Newton method. So maybe this is already sufficiently close to converge. So let's try the Newton method again. And if it converges, we're happy. If it doesn't converge, what we do, we're going to run another bit for the time course. And what we do in Copaz is that we now increase the time course by tenfold. So it was 0 0.1 units. Now it's going to be one unit of time. So we were at 0 0.1. We're going to end up at 1.1. And again, we test whether that has converged. If it has not converged, we again try the... If that has not converged, we go back and try the Newton method. Again, if that doesn't converge, we move on and we run another time course, but now another tenfold larger. So it was 10 seconds before, now it's going to be 100 seconds. And we continue doing this until there is a convergence or until we get to 10 to the 10 units of time, because we don't want to get a simulation. You know, we cannot go forever. It's at some point we have to give up. So this is the arbitrary case to give up. Um, that could be changed. That's this number here. The user can change that in Copasi. Um, you can make it smaller, you can make it larger. Usually, if you don't converge by 10 orders of magnitude, you're not going to converge. Um, adding more zeros is just going to make it longer before the software tells you you can't find the solution. Um, and here is an example of a method that ran. And you could see I highlighted in different colors the Newton method and the integration. So we first it failed the Newton method. And it's showing here the distance and the rate. Um, that is, how far away it estimated to be from the solution and how fast it's moving towards the solution. And it's moving too fast and it's too far away. Then it tries integration. And again, even though it's a bit slower at this point, the distance is still very large. Tries the Newton method again. Gets a little better, but basically not much. Again, integrates now for a longer time. It is already better. The distance has increased orders of magnitude, but still far away from our 10 to the minus 9. Uh, in fact, I think in this case, I run it with 10 to the minus 8. Um, and then again, it tries integration, Newton method. It keeps, in, it keeps going better. Integration here, it's almost there. And then Newton method eventually converges. And both the distance and the rate are smaller than 10 to the minus 9. And we even do another Newton step just to make sure we get a high quality solution. And that's the steady state. So this is how it works. So now I'm going to go and do some um, examples. But I'm going to give you opportunity to ask questions at this point. If anyone has any questions, please open your mic. Or perhaps I should I I have a short question. Yes, go ahead. So if we look at the predator prey model from yesterday, would we have a steady state there? Yeah, that's a good question. We're going to see something like that. Uh, perhaps, perhaps not. We're going to look at a different one, but it also an oscillation. Okay, so we will we will uh, follow up on that. Uh, any other questions? If not, then let me move forward. So 
once you calculate a steady state, you get a series of concentrations, which are the steady state concentrations. And those are basically the solutions. That's where the system would uh, relax to in the steady state. Be careful with if you think, if you see numbers like this one, which is a very small number, it's negative, but it's times 10 to the minus 27. This is effectively zero. I know people will look at it and say, oh, it's a negative number, but it's so small that it's within the resolution of the steady state. So that number is really zero. So we cannot be taken as a negative. It has to be taken as, as a very small number, uh, basically zero. So you get the species and you also get the, the reactions. If you go to reactions tab, you will get the fluxes of the reactions. So those are the steady state fluxes. And in fact, if you look at two, Consecutive reactions for steady state, they have to have the same rate. Otherwise, the species in the middle would be changing concentration. So those, that's how you, you obtain the results. Now, there's one other issue about steady states is that they may be stable or they may be unstable. Uh, and in fact, there's a third option, which is marginally stable. Turns out that's the, the one for the lotka volterra model. Um, the criteriums are if a system is stable, if the derivatives at the steady state, the second order derivatives of the function at steady state um, are negative. So the, the Jacobian matrix has only negative eigenvalues, um, real part negative. Then the system is stable. That means that if you apply a perturbation, it goes back to the original state. That is, the distance to the steady state decreases in time. That's why they're negative. But they could be positive. And if they're positive, that means if you apply perturbation, the system will move away from the steady state. And, and those steady states are called unstable. However, if you don't have any perturbation, the system may stay in, the, in that steady state. Uh, now, unstable steady states you cannot find by integration. You have to do it by integrating backwards in time. And Kopasi also does that, will also allow you to try integrating backwards. Uh, the marginally stable steady states, they basically have a, um, an eigenvalue of the Jacobian that is zero. And that means if you apply perturbation, they don't go back to where they were, but they also don't diverge. That's why they're called marginally stable. Um, the unstable steady states are really, in general, in an experiment, you could not observe them because in practice, there's always some noise in the system, even if it's just thermal noise, and that will perturb the system. And if it gets perturbed, the steady state is unstable, and so it will never return to the steady state. So unstable steady states are really not observable in practice, in the real world. Um, they are normally accompanied by oscillation. So many times, most of the times when you see an oscillation, it's because there is some unstable steady state inside that oscillatory behavior. And we will see an example in, in a moment. Um, you could think of unstable steady states, for example, if you try to uh, equilibrate uh, a, a stick in your, in your finger, if you're very good, you might be able to hold the stick upright for a little bit of time, but then you know, just a little movement and gravity will pull it down. So it is an unstable steady state, but it could be a steady state. Uh, if you drank too much coffee, you might not be able to actually do that trick either. So your, your hand will be moving. So the perturbations will come there and this, you will never observe that steady, that steady state. So let's look at, in practice, some, some examples. The first one is a very simple one, is a system that is in steady state. Um, it, this is a model of a branched pathway. Um, it's really just, uh, so I showed it yesterday. It's a branched pathway with sequential feedback inhibition, which mimics biosynthetic pathways um, in, in bacteria. Um, so there's a number of rates. The reactions are basically Michaelis-Menten. There's a couple that are allosteric inhibitions but the others are michaelis menten equations. So I can even look at the, at the differential equations. They're here. Um, so essentially when we solve the, when we apply the Newton method, we basically take this right-hand side and say it's equal to zero. And that's what the Newton method is applied on. This curve here does exactly the, that slope that I mentioned. And it does that for all, all of the species. So we, in Kopasi steady state, you come to the top steady state. You can tell it whether you want to perform the stability analysis. Normally, you want to do that. 
Um, I'm not changing any of the defaults. The defaults are resolution of 10 to the minus nine. Um, I'm not telling you the derivation factor, what it means, but if someone has questions, I can answer that later on. One thing you can do is you can, you can the default is to run the strategy just as I described using Newton method and integration. And then at the end, if the, those two don't work, we also try backwards integration to find neg um, unstable steady states. Um, but we could switch some of these off. I could switch the Newton method off, for example, and just use integration or vice versa. I could switch these two off and just use the Newton method. So the user has control over that, but normally we, we try everything. Um, and the other, this is just the number of iterations for the Newton method. So these are basically um, parameters that you can leave as default for, for now. So we just run and we have a steady state. And this is what you will see in Copaz if you, if you are running this example, here are the steady state concentrations. We also give you some other units here, which are so-called transition times, which is this concentration divided by the flux that goes through it. This gives you an idea of the time that the system would take to get to steady state. It's not that time to get to steady state because that's infinity because steady state is asymptotic, but it is a metric of how fast that variable takes. If you do a per if you apply perturbation, how quickly it moves back to the steady state. So the larger this number, um, the slower the variables are. And so in this system, they're not too far off, but these variables here converge much quickly than the first one. The first one takes longer. Then you can also look at the reactions. Here are the fluxes. Because it's a branched pathway, the first two steps, let's see the diagram again. Um, The first two reactions have the same flux. This reaction and that reaction both have the same flux, as of course is required. Otherwise, A would be changing if they were different because they are exactly the same. There's the same amount of A produced as it is consumed. And then reaction three and four, which are this branch here, um, actually it's three, four, and seven are all the same as well. And four, five, and eight are all the same as well. And in fact, if you add three and five, which is that one and that one, you end up with exactly the same value that two has. So when this branch is here, the sum of these two has to be equal to that one, because otherwise this B guy would be changing. So that's your steady state. Now, Copazi did also look at the stability. So you have a tab on stability. And the stability, the summary is written in text so you can actually understand it. It says this steady state is stable. And it also says that, well, but there may be some transient states in the vicinity um, may, may have some oscillations. That is, it may con it's probably con converges to the steady state doing some small oscillations. But those would be oscillations that get smaller and smaller. We call them damped oscillations. And then it gives you more information about the eigenvalues of the Jacobian, which I'm not going to get into. Um, of interest is this metric here called stiffness. That's the fastest rate divided by the slowest rate. And that means that in this case, they're 50 times the fastest reaction or the fastest rate is 50 times the slowest rate. So that gives you a metric of how far apart the time scales are. And when this number is very large, we say the system is stiff. 53 is not very large, so this system is really not stiff. But if it was um, 10 to the 6, then the, this system would definitely be stiff. Time hierarchy is another way of measuring the same thing, but it's a number between 0 and 1. So if it's close to 1, then your system is very stiff. Um, and these uh, numbers here are indicators for oscillations. I'm not going to go into them. We don't have time. Now, you can look at the Jacobian. Uh, of the system, which gives you, well, there's a complete and the reduced. We want to use look at the reduced, which gives you the um, eigenvalues. And this is the, the eigenvalues have a real and an imaginary part, but it's the real part that needs to be negative. So they are scaled here and the largest one is negative. That means the steady state is stable. That's why we can write, that's why the software wrote this, that the syntotic is an asymptotically stable steady state. 
Now, if you go even further, there's another tab here. This actually tells you what Copazi did. It tried the Newton method, and in this case, the Newton method converged on its own. So it never did, it never actually ran an, an, an integration. It never ran any time course because just from the initial guess, it could converge right away. That's not always the case. So more interesting, let's look at a system that oscillates. So I'm going to load that model from Biomodels that has the map kinase cascade. That's the Kolodenko model. It's Biomodels number 10. So I'm going to load it directly from, from Biomodels. That's the URL that I'm going to load a model from. It, and I know already that model number 10 is the Kolodenko model. So I can do this right away. Um, and I want, first of all, run a time course of this system, just so you know what the model looks like in um, what that model is like. So if I show you all the concentrations and I run this, you can see it's an oscillatory reaction. So it's not the Lotka Volterra model. It's a little bit more complicated, uh, but it's also oscillating. And you can look at specific variables and you see each one of them is oscillating. They all oscillate in different scales, but they're all oscillating. So here there's no steady state, right? So that's a good question. Uh, I think this is the question uh, that I got asked earlier. Uh, what happens now if I try to get a steady state? Well, um, let's see. Let's go to steady state. And um, if we do it just like this, use Newton and integration, Kopazi actually found a steady state. And here it is. These are the concentrations. And these are the fluxes. And do you want to see whether this is a real steady state or not? Um, we can move this into, if I click update model here, this button, it will make the initial concentrations be exactly these steady state concentrations. So that means my model, if I now, I have those concentrations in the model now, it's no longer the initial ones I had there. It's these steady state concentrations. So now my system will start from the steady state. So how does it look like if I now run this model from the steady state? Well, it's a steady state. There's nothing changing. And you have all the species, they're no longer oscillating. Okay, so this steady state was found, but it was not the one you saw in the beginning. So something's going on here, right? Well, if we go back to steady state and look at the stability, you will see that Kopazi tells you this steady state is unstable. It, and that means, if it, and it also says that it, there must be some oscillations around it. Okay, and we will see the oscillations in a moment. In fact, we already saw them. So... Now, now let's make a make a test. I told you a st an unstable steady state is one that, if you may apply a perturbation, it moves away. Let's apply a perturbation uh, at this time, at time 2000. Okay, I'm going to add an event to this model. And I'm going to create a very simple event that says at time two, two, 2000, I want to add a perturbation in one of the species. And I'm going to pick any species. I mean, any one works, but I'm going to do work two. And I want the concentration of work two to be equal to what it was before. So it's equal to itself. But if I do this, nothing happens, right? This is no perturbation. But I'm going to make it 1% higher. OK, so I multiply it by 1.01. .01. That means that it's, become, it's going to be 100. 1% higher at time 2000 than it would than its value of steady state. So let's see what happens now. So I apply the perturbation here. You can see it if I hide everything and just show ERG2. I apply the perturbation here. It's a tiny little blip and see what happens. After a while, the system starts going back to the oscillations. And now I could do this in any of, and of course, all the variables oscillate at that point. They all start oscillating. So this is a system, right? So you can apply the perturbation anywhere. Let's let's try applying it somewhere else. Okay, so rather than ERC2, let's take ERC2 away and change, uh, I don't know, MEC. 
So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to add a 1% perturbation. In fact, this time I'm going to add a 1%, but in the opposite direction. So I'm going to multiply this by 0.99. So I removed 1%. And I run the time course again. And the same thing happens. Now the perturbation is on up on this one. It's a tiny blip down. And doesn't matter which way you apply the perturbation. If you change the system from from that stable state, from that steady state, because it's unstable, it never returns. It always goes back to the oscillation. So I think this answers the question. The same similar thing would happen on the Lotka Volterra model. It's a bit different because the Lotka Volterra model, if you perturb the oscillations, they basically go back um, to another oscillation nearby. So it's it's not exactly the same uh, behavior here. It's it's a very special case it's also what the physicists call the harmonic oscillator so it's not it actually has some weird properties in terms of stability because it's marginally stable it's not really unstable it's marginally stable um so another thing that i wanted to show that i left for later is multiple uh state uh, systems that have multiple steady states um now that I'm not sure I'm going to have enough time to do it, but I'm going to try because um, soon we're going to have another um, presentation. Let me let me load a, a different model. Anyway, if there are questions, please go ahead and ask some questions now. The steady state calculation for that did it use the 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 first one like the one with the epsilon and the two time uh -huh. points or well so this steady state calculation used also an epsilon of 10 to the minus 9 is that what you were asking yes somehow because i i couldn't see how but uh, perhaps i just have to look into it a bit further Thank you. No, but, but uh, I think the question is whether it uses the rate or the distance as a criterion. It actually uses both. both. Ah, yes. Okay. Thank you. Both. So when it's when you have both, both of them have to be smaller than ten to the minus nine, which is achieved around here. This one still was not good, because. The rate was below 10 to the minus 9, but the distance wasn't. But then it actually achieves it here, and then and that's where it stops. But before, of course, none of these have. And if you look at them, uh, you know, for example, this one was going, the rate was going in the right direction, but uh, but the distance was not. It's still very long, very large distance. Um, okay, so let me... If we, I think I may may stop here because I mean uh, it was probably going to take me a little longer to do the multiple steady states. But the problem with the multiple steady states is the following: it's not just that the new the Newton method has some problems in it, and that's why we also combine it with integration. The first one is that it sometimes doesn't converge. We've seen that we we resolve that by using integration, but it also is not guaranteed to converge to the nearest steady state from where the initial conditions was. And that means that if you just use the Newton method, if you don't use integration, you don't know if the steady state that you found, in case your system has more than one steady state, if the one you found is the one you would reach from that initial condition. You can only reach one. From any initial condition, you can only reach one steady state. But from different initial conditions, you may, diff may may reach different steady states. This is actually a theorem in in uh, dynamical systems. It's 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 a proven theorem, so that I can guarantee you that from any position, you always hit one steady state, not another. But from different positions, you would hit different ones. But that's if you do integration. If you use the Newton method, you're not guaranteed to get there. So if you're if you're trying to do say parameter estimation of a system that has multiple steady states and you are using um fitting for the steady state then you should never use the newton method you should then only use integration 
because otherwise it's not the system might be jumping from one to the other at different iterations and you don't know it's just finding one steady state and it it might not be the same corresponding one to when it was converging before so the algorithms will get confused and will not fit your data so that's the one thing you have to be careful if you have multiple steady states you really need to then start using integration and if you want to find with and that way you will find which one you reach not not any steady state but the one that is reachable from the initial conditions okay i think i'm going to um, stop sharing the screen thank you very much and we can move on to the next one yeah. <clears throat>